hosted by Institute of Teacher Education, International Languages Campus, or better known as IPGKBA, with the team Capacity Building, Educational Leadership and Management. This is the last of our 18 series webinar session. A few housekeeping matters as usual before we start. First, everyone who attends to this webinar series will be given an e-certificate at the end of October. Therefore, do not forget to register yourself now. For international participants, your IC number is 111111. Second, we would love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have any questions for our speaker, please feel free to send it through the chat box. The speaker will be answering questions at the end of the session. If we don't answer your questions during today's webinar, we will be sure to follow up afterwards. And last, we would like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks. As today is the last of the 18 CD webinar, we will, have a, we will have the sharing session followed by the closing ceremony of IPG KBA's Virtual Colloquium 2020. With that, let me introduce our moderator for today, Juan Anish Alicia Abdullah. Juan Anish obtained her academic and professional qualification in science and TESOL from University, National University of Malaysia and University of Malaya, re respectively. She attained her postgraduate certificate in trainer development in English language teaching from the University College, St. Mark, St. John's, Plymouth. She has been a teacher, a teacher educator, and currently she is the educator of Institute of Teacher Education, sorry, she is the director of Institute of Teacher Education, Tun Abdul Razak Campus, Sarawak. Her areas of interest and involvement also include primary innovation, which she works with the British Council, differentiated instruction, coaching and mentoring, ELT trainer development, research on early literacy, as well as efficacy beliefs of teachers. With that, let me welcome Juan Anis. To you, Juan Anis. Thank you very much, Dr. Selva, for the introduction. Assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session. And it's wonderful to know that we have participants from many countries joining our webinar uh, session this morning. Uh, our topic of discussion today focuses on gender equality in educational uh, leadership. Now, compared to the times of our forefathers, admittedly, the world has made great strides towards greater gender equality. And now today, more girls are able to access and continue their primary education. Legal reforms are making education more responsive to the needs of millions of underserved women and girls. However, is this nearly enough to meet the SDGs on education and employment by 2030? Well, according to UNICEF report 2019, worldwide, one in every four girls aged 15 to 19 are in neither education, employment, nor training compared to one in 10 boys. So that's about 50% less. I would assume that most of our participants this morning to be either teachers or from the education field and as educators, as teachers, you and I play a significant role to an equal future. One that not only recognizes gender equality, but promotes gender equality. Therefore, our session today would hopefully inspire us to take positive step steps in our own capacity to level the playing field particularly in education and leadership. We are privileged to have, to have with us this morning a very credible speaker on this subject. Uh, and in the next 40 minutes or so, she'll be sharing her perspectives on gender equality in educational leadership. She is Professor Dr. Gina Zanolini Morrison, a Tinoet professor with Wilkes University. 
and she has a PhD in human development and instructional leadership and a master's in counselor education. She started her career as a secondary school teacher before she went on to teach at the university. And uh, for the first 14 years with Wilkes University, she was with the education department where she was entrusted with preparing teacher trainees and teaching on the graduate level before she moved on to the then newly uh, formed Division of Global Culture six years ago and where she remains until now. Uh, among the many courses that she had taught, developed and taught, and which are closely related to our topic today, would be leadership, uh, diversity, diversity and intercultural communication. Prof Gina is no stranger to Malaysia, where she served as a Fulbright specialist back in 2018. And now she too serves at Will University, Wilkes University as their Fulbright program advisor, helping their students and alumni get Fulbright grants abroad. Prof Gina received a number of awards from Wilkes University for her vast contribution. And I asked her, Prof Gina, which of the awards are you most proud of? Because she's got this really long list. So she says, okay, this would be the Carpenter Award for Excellence in Teaching and more recently, Global Scholar and Citizen Career Award. And uh, her varied experiences have also resulted in her somewhat varied research interests, uh, although they're all tied to cultural diversity. Now, this would include teaching strategies to embrace diversity and promote cultural identity development different types of modernities, and Southeast Asian working women as keepers of culture. Now, before I hand over this session to Prof. Gina, let me just briefly uh, explain the format of this session. Prof. Gina will have about 40 minutes to share with us. And you have, if you have any questions for Prof. Gina at any time during the session, you can just send it through the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of her presentation, Prof. Gina and I will be having a conversation uh, whereby I will bring in some of my personal experiences and Prof. Gina will be answering some of the questions. Without further ado, I will now pass this session over to Prof. Gina. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction, Ms. Anis. And I look forward to talking with you again later on in this presentation. I also really need to thank Chairperson Dr. Selva as well as Dr. Prema and Dr. Chandran, who have invited me to take part in this very exciting colloquium and who have helped me to connect to you from the United States. So welcome, Salamat Datang, Bienvenidos. I must say Salamat Pagi, good morning to my colleagues in Malaysia, but to my friends in the Americas, I should say Buenas Noches, because right now it is 9 p.m. on Monday night here in Pennsylvania, Northeastern United States. And uh, our weather is getting cooler now. It is turning autumn, but it's very still very pleasant. The trees are turning all colors. And people usually drive from all over to come and see our trees here in Pennsylvania. But because of COVID, things are a little bit quiet this year. So I'm a professor of global cultures at Wilkes University, which is a small private liberal, liberal arts university that has been nationally ranked in the 2021 um, edition of Best Colleges of National Universities. And it is my pleasure to talk to you today about gender equality and educational leadership. And it, uh, it, I, I'm so glad you could join me. Uh, I wonder if I could ask you to just write two things in the chat, if, if you don't mind, those of you who are with us right now. First of all, your gender. Please tell me your gender. And second of all, I'd like you to think about the people who are in the in the pay grades above you, like supervisors, are they mostly men or mostly women? For me, example, for example, I report to my department chair, that's a man. Um, he reports to the, the college dean, and that's a man. He reports to the provost, that's a woman, and she reports to the president, so that's a man. So I would say mostly men. So, um, Please go ahead and do that now, if you don't mind. So we have an idea, Ms. Anis and I, of who we're talking, who, who we're talking to today. 
So uh, while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and list a few assumptions regarding today's session before I actually get into the session. First of all, I'm assuming that I don't have to prove to you how important it is to strive for gender equality in educational leadership. I assume that you've joined this session because you've already accepted, accepted equality as a desired outcome for your educational institution and that you're interested in moving ahead towards that end. After all, if we don't groom both men and women for effective leadership, we're missing out on maximizing our full potential uh, collectively as a community of educators. And, you know, we all live in this world. We all have eyes and ears. So we already know we can see that women are underrepresented in educational institutions. So you don't need me to tell you that. I'll assume we're already on that same page with the need for equality. My second assumption, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you agree with my point of view, that we can learn from each other's experiences, that even though we're quite different and culturally, and we live in different countries with different government regulations and different laws, there is still a strong commonality among educators because of the universal process of learning, that messy but magical process of, of learning that got us all hooked on education in the first place. You know, I can still recall my early days of teaching. I began as an ESL teacher. I was teaching young adults from all over the world. And um, I remember that moment when they would magically somehow start to form phrases in English and then sentences uh, in order to talk to each other or scold each other or crack a joke. You know, that's the thrill that got me hooked. I'm assuming that you have your own stories of how you got hooked on education. And I'm assuming that the essence of that moment was the same for all of us. And that's our common ground from which we can communicate and learn from each other. My third assumption is that even though, you know, one of my specialties is, is diversity and inclusion, I still need to claim my bias because I do have bias. I mean, we all have bias. We all have a certain point of view. And my perspective is that I see things through the eyes of a white American woman, a baby boomer. And therefore I have to tell you, I don't know everything, right? In fact, Americans in general have had a very humbling few years lately, particularly during 2020. And, you know, we've had to acknowledge that we can do better. We've been struggling, struggling with COVID, the economy, education, poverty, racism, protests, riots, gay rights, women's rights. We absolutely do not have all the answers and we are struggling. But I believe that even though I have a sort of blindness because actually because I'm American, like sometimes we have blinders on, but even though I have that, disadvantage, uh, I can still work through it to try to see the systemic sexism that pervades educational institutions, because if we can see it, then maybe we can know it and understand it. And if we understand it, then we can begin to dismantle it. My fourth assumption is that I assume that you believe, like I do, that uh, leadership comes in many forms. I mean, some people lead as teachers. That's, that's what I do in our own classrooms. Some as instructional designers, some as administrators, some as managers, and all types of leadership are valuable. Some leaders just get paid more. And that shows you how society values the various types of leadership. <clears throat> and my fifth and last assumption is that in order to tackle this problem of gender inequality, in educational leadership, we must always pay attention to the ABCs of human nature. A, affect, feelings. I know there's a lot of uh, English teachers out here, ESL, <clears throat> and we learned about Krashen's effective filter. Remember that one? We learned that if, if we don't feel comfortable, we don't do so well in an environment if we don't feel that we belong there. So that affective filter really matters to you when you are learning. And it matters when you're trying to step up and take a risk in order to be an educational leader. So that's the A's. B, behavioral, the things we do. 
and C, cognitive, the cognitive aspect of human nature, the things we think. And when I think about behavioral and cognitive, I, I always think about Vygotsky, uh, his, uh, his theory about the zone of proximal development. I know you know that one too. Um, when he says, we have to, we don't learn something once. So I don't think you'll go out after this session and change the world all of a sudden. We have to work through it again and again and again. We have to talk to each other. We have to construct our path forward. <clears throat> we need to help each other in the process. So to sum up my assumptions, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but let's review a few things to build awareness so that together we can all do our best in small ways and in different ways to work towards creating equal access and opportunity for women in educational leadership. Um, do you agree with these assumptions? I hope so. Okay, I, I'm going to turn to the presentation. Well, while we're pulling that up, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Anis, how are we doing on the chat? Do you see any general trends with anything? Okay. Um, the anything? general response is uh, male. So far, I've got no female. The, the general response is male. So there'll be more males, which more is what we expected. <laughs> more males are attending or more male bosses? No, more, more male boss. Okay. Bosses. Yes. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful. Well, that's what we thought, right? That is what we expected. Thank you very much. So let's go back to the presentation. If I could ask uh, my someone who's helping me with the PowerPoint slides um, to, oh, there we go. Okay, here's, here's my topic. These are my topics today. You probably read the abstract, so this is no surprise. Um, we're going to go over four different subtopics. The structures that are embedded in educational systems that perpetuate inequality, particularly that affect um, gender inequality. Number two, differences in the communication style of men and women. Now, we don't want to we don't want to perpetuate any stereotypes there, but there are preferred differences. And sometimes those differences lead to misunderstandings. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Number three, we'll, we'll discuss some microaggressions that undermine the success of women leaders in, in education and can undermine anybody, those subtle little things. We'll talk about that in a second. And fourth is strategies to enhance the development of Practices that support leadership, like what, what can we do about it, that behavioral uh, aspect of the ABCs. Okay, next, next slide. Before we go any further, I think it's important to uh, clarify the difference between equality and equity. Now, equality, equality is when everybody is equal, everybody's the same. So, and you see that first picture there, we see three, three kids watching the game. And they all got the same box to stand on, equal, right? Only they're not equal. You see, equity is that somebody needs a little extra support along the way so that they all can get in the game. And um, that's the thing about equity. Sometimes you need to give special supports if you're trying to reach equality. And that's what I, I, I would like you to keep in mind today, those special supports if we're trying to reach the goal of equality. And I, I know we are. Uh, next, please. So first, we're, uh, let's talk about the structures perpetuating gender inequality. First of all is the biggest probably. It is uh, the cultural expectations and the stereotypes that we all have in our culture, right? Um, in many, many cultures, boys are more highly valued than girls. And sometimes if a parent has to choose one, one student to go to college and they have a, a son and a daughter, uh, they, they might choose the son because they think that is a better investment. Uh, it's sad, but it's just the way it is. Uh, we, and we all internalize sexism. We all internalize things with, without thinking. We all sort of perpetuate it, even unknowingly. Even I am always educating myself on um, the disparities and things, and, and you know, gender disparities. I, I I study it, but even in my own family, I 
I, at the Thanksgiving table, when we all get together, the extended family, I feel that there should be a man at the head of the table, the oldest man, where if, you know, right now, this Thanksgiving, the oldest person at our family table should be my sister. She's the eldest in the family. So, you know, without realizing, and I'm a sexist too, right? We are. This is, this is, this is what happens. We don't think critically about the the mores, the cultural mores that we're passing on. And we somehow feel, sometimes we don't feel that we are uh, equal, you know, to, to men. And, and, and we need to start thinking about that. Uh, the other uh, structure is the work family balance that is very stressful for women. If I'm, if I'm talking to any women out there, and I hope I am, um, I know you can relate to this. This can get huge because many cultures assume that the woman is going to be the one to manage the family, uh, be the, sort of the, the head, like to manage the family and take care of everything going on in the household. And while working women are juggling full-time jobs and responsibilities at home, it's very, very stressful. And if you don't believe me, um, how about if, if you've ever had a child in school get sick and the principal has to call you or the headmaster and uh, say, you know, come and get your child, the child is sick. I know they call the woman first. They call, they call the mother before the father. Um, and this always happens. We are expected to leave our jobs and then we have to make up the work later or our, our bosses might not like that, you know, too much if it happens a lot and children do go through those f phases, right? Uh, a friend of mine, she just got so tired of it. She said, when the school called her, she said, listen, this kid has two parents, call his, call his father. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but that, that is a unique stress that women are, seem to face a little bit more than men, although men certainly nowadays uh, as well. Uh, also lack of equitable supports, like what we talked about in that uh, visual. I, I think maybe if we're trying to get more uh, women leaders and into the game, maybe they need a little bit of support by, I don't know, maybe maternity leave so they can uh, take time off, you know, and get paid for it to have children, which it's not a, a law in the United States. So uh, that that's a problem. Or how about uh, maybe a daycare center nearby, near to your institution? And and some of you, I think, have institutions already doing that. And we, uh, we, uh, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're making strides, as Juan is said. But the other thing that we have is, you know, we have this, uh, we have sexism in the English language, right? And you're English teachers, like I used, I used to be an English teacher. And you, you, we don't realize we're perpetuating sexism because we teach English. I mean, I found this little paper. You see in the bottom of that screen, it uh, says the suggested reading. I found this paper by Zhu uh, in, uh, from China. He wrote this, and he says the sexism in English. And he says that because it, the, the root of the language is from <clears throat> the British uh, Empire, which is male-dominated, it's that gave a favor towards uh, male, men in the language. We say actor, and then we have to change it for the woman. Actress, host, hostess, uh, god, goddess, hero, heroine, hero, hero, heroine, right? And so it's like the male is always the default. Uh, you know, a man, um, and Mark, you know, we say mankind, we should say humankind or humanity, uh, manpower. And, and man-made, we should say workforce or synthetic. These are words that we are starting to uh, think about now. In fact, um, even the pronoun he or she, we used to always say he is the default. Everyone needs to do his own work, I would say in class. And then I would say, well, everyone needs to do his or her own work. And then sometimes I'd switch it up. Everyone needs to do her own work, but then the boys really didn't like that. And then it was like, well, what do you say? Finally, now they're allowing the plural. Everyone needs to do their own work. I always think Malay is so much better in, in that regard. They have one pronoun for he or she, and that, and that pronoun is uh, dia. Uh, are, my, 
are my slides still up because I need to go to the next point? Okay, thank you. Um, the pay disparity. Now, I want to talk about the pay disparity for a while before we move to the next slide. Overall, uh, I, I imagine, you know, statistics are different in every country. And even though we are moving ahead in the United States, we're still not where we need to be. And we are protected by law. Yet, for every dollar that a man makes, a full-time man working, every dollar he makes, a woman only makes 81 cents. So, and that varies by race. Um, so we're, and overall, the U.S. Census tells us that overall, a full-time man or the median salary for full-time working men is almost 10,000 greater than for the full-time working women. And we are protected by laws. Well, so you might ask, well, why is that happening? Well, again, there's that um, childbearing penalty for having children, uh, you have to take time off and you don't always get paid for that, although some com companies do. But uh, also women are more likely than men to step away from their careers to take other care of other family members, maybe elderly parents. It's, it's, it's more likely the, the woman who will step away and then lose that, that momentum going forward in her career. But also there's this thing called occupational segregation that affords higher pay for women or, or for people in the male-dominated careers, such as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and lower pay for the female-dominated dom professions like uh, nursing and uh, teaching, classroom teaching. So, okay. Well, let's, uh, I, I wanted to talk about disparity. I just thought, let me just talk about my own experience. I, this slide, I, I went around campus last week and I took pictures of, of posters that the students had put up because it's the year of the vote. Honestly, I totally forgot. It was 100 years ago, 1920, when women got the right to vote. And this is a big uh, vote, a big election next week coming up. We have more women invested in politics than ever before. So the students at Wilkes University are celebrating the year of the vote. And I took some of these, these uh, photos. And I love this, you know, women get things done. Yay. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, but it, except I need to tell you about 2020 wasn't the year for all women. It was the year for white women who got the vote. Black women get didn't get the vote until uh, I mean, 1920, they got the vote in 1964. So you see, uh, there is a lot of racial disparity. But they did put up that video, uh, the, uh, the poster of the four women there. And I love that because the first one is Sojourner, Sojourner Truth. And she was born in the late 1700s into American slavery. And she it was an incredible um, person who really was uh, empowered herself. She took her daughter and escaped into freedom. And then she later sued, uh, she took a, a white man to court and she won, which is unheard of. And I love this phrase that she has. She says, if women want any rights more than they've got, why don't they just take them and not be talking about it? And I love that because it very it's very empowering to women. Actually, we shouldn't say, oh, woe is me, because men really are not the oppressors. Men want equality. I think they, they want it too. And uh, she empowers us to just go out and take it. And I kind of like that. The second one there is Gloria Steinem. Do you know that name? I'm sure you do. She was the, the voice of feminism in the 60s and 70s. And um, she she co-founded Ms. Magazine, very strong woman's rights advocate. And I saw Gloria Steinem uh, just about two blocks up the street in Wilkes-Barre in 2016 when she was campaigning for Hillary Clinton. The woman in the front is Anita Hill. And Anita Hill was famous for having charged a uh, Supreme Court justice with sexual harassment. And there was a hearing, it was a very public hearing at which Anita Hill, who was actually the victim we turned out 
we we all uh, figured out as the years went by how how poorly she was treated because everybody blamed her for it. But never mind. Anita, Anita Hill went on to become a lawyer, uh, a lawyer and a professor, and a very strong women's rights advocate. And last, of course, is Malala, who um, was a, a really vocal advocate for ch girls uh, being educated and w refused to be silenced even when the Taliban shot her in the face. And luckily she survived and went on to become a global force for girls in education. And she, at 23, she was the youngest uh, Nobel Prize laureate. So we can uh, go to the next slide. Then some of these uh, are other things. And I hope that we can share the PowerPoint with you uh, so that you can you can look these up. But that, that one says that 61 cents, a black, black woman earns only 61 cents to every dollar that a white man makes, even though black women are the most educated group in this country. So you see the disparities, it intersects along lines of race and everything, um, race and gender, um, socioeconomic status and so forth. So uh, that three quarters of, that three quarter, all these statistics, three quarters of the teachers uh, are uh, women and uh, they're white and white women. And we really should try to get teachers in that classroom, especially the primary grades. We, we need a lot of more men in there and more um, racially diverse teaching staff in this country and worldwide, because it's great when the students can see somebody who see themselves reflected in the teacher as well. And one more of these slides, please, coming up. The next next one. We have another slide there. I know it's just two more posters. Next slide, please. We can see that 38% of women who were surveyed who were harassed on the job left their career. So who, who suffers when that happens? But this last poster is the one that got me. Three, only 3.2% 3 of sports media coverage co goes to women, women's sports in this country. And, you know, we have fantastic women's sports teams in this country. Only 3.2% of the media is on women. So that's just a little something for you to know what's going on in, in locally. It, it, and it's, it's happening everywhere. Year of the vote, very important year. Next, please. We'll have another, the next slide. So the second major point that I'd like to talk to you about is communication differences. Deborah, of course, I have to talk about Deborah Tannen because she's a linguist, professor of linguistics who uh, studies linguistic styles and patterns. And she says that, you know, don't forget, language is more than, it does more than communicate ideas, it communicates power. And that she, she discovered some different ways of interacting. And uh, one thing that she discovered really, really, just a pattern that she saw, for example, was high involvement, where people are talking very quickly, interactively. How's it, oh my gosh, goodness, how does this, and, they add, they add, and they're overlapping sometimes in speech. It's very enthusiastic and friendly uh, kind of style of talking. And then versus high considerateness, where one person will not start speaking until the other one finishes. So that's like a, a tennis match. The ball goes here, the ball goes there. And she noticed that that's a different in styles. And certainly this is something we can see in culture, just like the next one, indirect, indirect versus versus direct. Like Americans tend to be very direct. I might say, um, wow, it's really cold in here. Can we turn that air conditioner down? But I noticed that my Malaysian colleagues who are kind of, you know, more indirect, they may not say anything at all. They simply keep their shawls on the back of their chairs and they wrap themselves in the shawl <laughs> rather than the Americans saying, you know, play, turn the air conditioner down. So I could talk to you about that a long time because uh, my husband is Malaysian and, and kind of indirect in answering and I'm a very direct person. So that's another presentation. Uh, but here, she, Deborah Tannen 
discovered that men and women really differ in communication style. She said that women are very uh, interested in talking with uh, about creating relationships, rapport. So they do rapport talk to develop like an intimacy, a friendly atmosphere. And I noticed that uh, Puananis was doing that with me before the session start, started because I was getting very nervous. <laughs> and she she just started to say, how's the weather there? How's everything? And, and, and that is very important to women, where men often uh, prefer to do report talk, where they simply spill information or they want to get the job done and not, you know, um, report report what they know or what needs to be done. So that's a differing style. And you might be used to leaders who come in and get things done right away, but it's also a leadership uh, method to build rapport and move ahead in that way. The other thing that she noticed was that overlapping is a um, call. It's like the cooperative way. It's not really, you don't really mean to shut anybody up. You, you just need to, you know, you're excited, you're talking over each other. And that, again, there's some culture styles. But women tend to do that as well, saying, oh, is that right? Oh, wow, I didn't know. Those little things that keep a conversation going. Whereas um, she noticed in men do more interrupting. And that's all about getting control of the conversation and stopping what's going on and, and controlling. And it and of course, that needs to be done sometimes uh, by us teachers uh, too. But um, I I went to a, a women's conference in Philadelphia a few years ago, and I saw Madeline Albright speak. She was our um, Secretary of State, and she said, "Women, I have one word of advice for you: learn to interrupt." And she said she had to learn to interrupt because she was really a major actor on the political stage and she was meeting with diplomats diplomats from all over and she got tired of people talking over her men mostly and uh she learned to interrupt and she learned how to stop an interruption so that was her word of advice and i never forgot it i, I still don't really do that but you know um anyway it's good something to keep in mind she said also you know just just remember men and women do differ in the way that they give orders criticism take you know, compliments, give compliments, apologize, ask questions. And there are just different ways to do things. Doesn't mean that one way is better than the other, just that we understand that there are different ways of communicating. Next slide, please. Oh, I need to talk to you about this third point, microaggressions. You've probably heard the word. There's a great book on it. You see um, at, the, the, at the bottom there is the reference, but I've put all these references in, in one slide at the end of the, at the end of the PowerPoint for you. But this is by edited by Daryl Wing Sue. And, and a microaggression is a little uh, comment or action that conveys a prejudiced attitude towards a member of a marginalized group, like maybe unintentionally. And these are the little things that people say that they don't even realize what they're saying to people. And it, it can go, you know, to any marginalized group. But I tried to think of some, and I, I called my colleague up to ask me for some help. Give me some, you know, um, examples of microaggressions. How about this one? I never thought I'd like working for a woman. I don't know if you ever had heard anything like that, but I'm mean, like, why not? Like, Women are likable people and what's not to like. So, uh, or uh, something that diminishes the uh, uh, woman, like smart and pretty too, sort of uh, objectifies. Uh, this one, sorry, uh, somebody actually said this. I can't stop to talk. I have an appointment with someone important. Or wait, don't sit in that seat. That's for the superintendent or that's for the, uh, the principal. When the woman is the principal, oh, uh, I'm waiting to speak to someone. Uh, somebody important is coming to interview me, and the and the woman said this actually happened. Yeah, I'm I'm the reporter. No, it's a very important interviewer from the New York Times. She said, Yeah, that that's me. <laughs> so uh, then he said, Well, do you have a card? <laughs> and 
And she, she did, and she wrote the article. So, I mean, sometimes we don't realize how it diminishes others. Or they say, uh, tell us how girls feel about that and expecting women to speak for every one of their gender. Or tell us, you know, and even saying girls is a bit pejorative. So uh, I, I would be interested to know if, if you hear anything, it, keep it, you know, you could send me them if you want, Gina.Morrison at Wilkes.edu. I'd love to hear your examples. And we'll go to the fourth, uh, the no next slide, which is the fourth point. Strategies. Okay. Now we are developing awareness. What can we do about it? Well, teachers, the first thing that you can do, that we can do, is examine and adjust our own practices. We can stay mindful of not only our words, but our nonverbals too. What are we expressing to our students? I, I have to think about that, uh, especially ESL. What do those kids think when they sit in our classrooms and we're not smiling? They must be so scared, you know. Um, we have to show that we're open and, and um, we just have to watch our words too and our, our, our nonverbals. Be sure that women's stories are represented in your literature. I mean, this is what I do in higher ed. When I create a course and I look at the required readings and I look it over and say, what's the race? What's the gender? Uh, what's the ethnicity of the writer? Because if I don't have a variety of perspectives in my course, um, then I'm not doing my job teaching these courses. So I, I, I have to look for it. So you'll be happy to know today that I put a little star by every, every woman author on that page at the, at the end of this PowerPoint. Um, and then they're mostly women authors, but um, I have to tell you about uh, teachers before I leave you this famous study by Satker and Sat Satker. They were a married couple and they, they did this big, big project where they went into so many classrooms and videotaped, video recorded how the, the teacher interacted with the students in the classrooms. And then they, then they uh, looked it over for themes because um, they, they, what they found were, was astounding. And they put the, the papers together. In fact, 1994 was a big year for them. They had a lot of stuff out, but they wrote a book on the themes and they took the results around to the teachers. Actually, before they even published the book, they went back to the teachers and said, do you know that you stand uh, more, you stand where the boys are and you deliver instruction to the boys more than the girls? Do you know that you call more boys by name than girls? Do you know that you engage the boys in more uh, quali quality? You ask them to, to reach a little bit further, to do a little bit better. And the girls, you, you remark on their superficial characteristics, like, oh, that's very nice handwriting. Where on the boys' responses, they get an in-depth quality. Hey, I think you can do better. Now think about that. You know, you're pulling answers out of the boys. And these teachers were really upset. They said, no way, no way. I did not do that. And so Satkar and Satkar went back and found the video footage and showed it to them. And they were shocked. Oh my goodness. I do do that. Right. <laughs> so uh, there were a lot of things in that book. And I also, I think it's called uh, failing schools. And that was in America um, that I al always covered with my student teachers when I was in the education department, because we we did. I did some of those things unknowingly too. I and I. I think I was learning the boys' names before the girls' names in my classrooms, and um, so what I would do is I would invite in order instead of me lecturing on this, they they had to do the reading. I wasn't going to lecture. I said, okay, interactive activity. I want three volunteers, three men, three women. So the men, oh yeah, the men would come up. And as the men would take the chairs in the front of the room, I would shake their hands and say, oh, thank you, Bobby. James, uh, thank you. And I, a, 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 a pat on the back. And then the, the women would come out, come in and I'd say, okay, take that seat. 
sit there and I wouldn't say their names. And then I would continue with the demonstration. I would like ask them questions about the, uh, the, the lecture that we had. And I would give them the feedback that Satgar and Satgar said that we give to our, our, our students. And I noticed that the boys were just shouting out answers and I'd call on them because that's what Satgar and Satgar said that we do. And the boys were so empowered, you know, they just kept talking. And the, the women, uh, they were men and women actually, they were young, young men and women, teacher trainees, but the, the women would raise their hands and raise their hands and I wouldn't call on them. I would rather spend my time drawing the answer, drawing the answer out of the, the men. And we you know what happens when a student raises their hand so much, they stop raising it. And that's really sad. So at the end, then of course I would debrief them and say, well, how did you feel? And the, and the women were mad. Well, I don't, I don't believe you wouldn't even talk. You wouldn't even call on me. So it is this uh, affective, uh, like fashion's affective feature. Uh, so sometimes we also have to notice that we do give more air time to boys in the classroom to men, we seem to feel that they have the right to speak longer than the the girls, or it seems maybe the young ladies themselves feel that the young men have the right to speak longer. So I, that was something else that Satker and Satker talked about that boys do get more airtime. So uh, he suggested this and I tried it in the next class with my teacher trainees. He said, if you want to go for equality, try this exercise, take, um, take some tokens. Uh, so I took these coins, they're just like fake coins. And I gave I, uh, two to every student. And I said, these are your tokens. When you make a comment, you have to make a comment. You have to make two comments during this discussion. When you make a comment, you can spend your token, but you, you cannot keep it. In order to leave the class today, you have to make two comments. So everybody gets to make two comments. And so, you know, I had to really have a lot of questions in my mind to ask. And I went around collecting tokens. And people were trying to bargain with each other. The people who like to talk a lot were, uh, and sometimes it was, women and sometimes it was men uh they were bargaining to so they could have the final say on things um and of course i wouldn't allow it but that's a really good technique if you want to get those quiet people in your class talking you want to hear every voice in the classroom that's when i'm most happy when i can hear everybody's voice in the classroom so okay teachers you can think of your own strategies i know you're a creative bunch and supervisors so are you and you have some power there you can promote for equality and you can offer that support. Like the first thing you should be doing, in my opinion, I, I promise I wasn't going to tell you what sh you should do. I highly suggest you review your faculty, your staff's pay for equity and equality and make sure that people are being paid the same amount for the same work and make the necessary corrections. Even if you just advocate for this, it's a step in the right direction. You, you do want to start grooming your leaders. I mean, suppose you have somebody who works in the office and you see that she really has a very great ability to organize and deal with people. Maybe she just needs a mentor. Maybe you can find a mentor for her to have her step up. Maybe you can organize mentors for people to, especially women. Maybe you can ask the women, do they want a, a faculty, a, a woman's caucus among the faculty? Uh, these are things that, that you can do to support support the leadership and to groom leaders among the women and, and the men, but particularly the women. We want more. And always remember your ABCs, the, the feelings and behaviors and thoughts all count. So most of all, we want to stop the cycle. You have to commit to prof regular professional development. And I know that's a requirement here. But we really need to do it to so that we can uh, open our minds and build our awarenesses. I know that my education has had a lot of gaps in it, and it was my it is continues to be my responsibility to fill in those gaps because otherwise I'm not I'm not a very good educator. And we can have the next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. 
and I have some final thoughts, thank you, um, on building a culture that promotes equality. You should embrace differences while looking for commonalities and just say, well, this is a different way. And I, know, I honestly, I know that my friends in Malaysia are pretty good at this, but that's the way to start. Embrace differences. Question yourself first. Ask, you know, what can I do in my own domain? How can I make a little bit of a difference? And next, understand that cultural resets happen slowly. And that's what we need to do is have a cultural reset. We need to do something to make the ground fertile to grow more uh, women leaders in, in the education, educational domain. And advocate for equality. You, you have to advocate, you have to say it, right? That means you, you claim it, you say it. You don't say, oh, well, I don't think it's feminine to speak out loud. You, I mean, we have to, we have to advocate in, in our own style, but don't just stay silent. If you stay silent, um, it, 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 won't, it won't work. And identify allies. That's always a good part to do because then you know who to call when you're really stressed out. But among women and men, because men are allies. And, and women are too. So develop a network of allies. We all want the same thing. And uh, listen more than you talk. I know when you get in circles and you start to talk, it's, it's a good thing to sometimes just sit back and listen and then reflect and validate the experiences of others. And one more, I think there's one more slide, maybe two. Next slide. So you thought you were going to get away without an assignment. I can't help it. I'm a teacher. So I'm giving you an assignment. Um, I'd like you to think of one small thing that you would like to see changed in your own classroom or office or school or institution to promote equal access to educational leadership for women and girls. One little thing, maybe, maybe there's one girl in your class that you think um, you, you, she really should have, uh, go into mathematics or something, maybe talk to her parents, or there's somebody that you, maybe you want to form a women's caucus, or maybe you have a project. It, it doesn't have to be big. It could be even whispering a word of encouragement in someone's ear. Take that risk. Why don't you put your name in for that job? And here, let me read your letter of application. We have to support each other in this, men and women. We have to support each other. We want to get more women in educational leadership. So talk it over with someone, develop your strategy, and then try it and see, see what happens. And in these ways, big changes start with small actions. So we can have a grassroots movement from the, from the bottom up. Of course, our ministers and our supervisors are working from the top down. And, you know, we could sort of meet in the middle. We could have both approaches and either way, we're going to get it. Okay, next slide, please. So those are the references and you can see the stars um, by the women. And finally, the reference, uh, uh, finally, final slide. Uh, there's my email. You know, if you try something, I would love to hear how it goes for you. I, I'd be happy. I would be so happy if you would email me. And, uh, you know, the world is a small place. So thank you for listening. And Juan Anas, I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Gina, for sharing with us your perspectives on gender equality in educational leadership. Very interesting talk. Now, uh, briefly summarize. Prof. Gina spoke on structures embedded in the society uh, that leads to gender inequality. Uh, she spoke on stereotyping, sexism in language, and also pair disparity. Uh, she also touched on differences in communication styles between men and women that can actually lead to misunderstanding. Yeah? And also on microaggressions, uh, subtle comments that people make unintentionally that actually could undermine the success of women leaders and Prof Gina was you know asking us whether we have examples I have one example which yeah. happened just yesterday and um, I was attending this meeting and because we did not have the opportunity to introduce ourselves so because the chair chairperson the chairman came late so 
there were a group of us, uh, two females and then myself and another lady. So most of the time when he was speaking, he was actually addressing my male colleague actually. And then I think a few minutes into the meeting, then he just realized, um, she was, he was saying, uh, you're the director, you know, looking at uh, my male colleague. And then my male colleague said, no, uh, she is our director. So he went and said, oh, a lady, you know. Uh, so I think that's an example. I think I, I don't think that he had the intention to undermine me. But these are microaggressions that we probably uh, are not conscious of. Yeah. And uh, finally, Prof Gina shared on some strategies to support leadership, uh, what teachers can do in the classroom. Uh, we may be unintentionally sidelining the girls, you know, and I like that suggestion that Prof Gina gave about, you know, using tokens uh, for equal a, a time between the girls and the boys. And of course, she spoke on how supervisors can support equality uh, among the staff. Now, going back to what Prof Gina has shared on cultural stereotyping that leads to gender inequality. Um, allow me, Prof Jinaya, to share my own experiences on this. Yeah, I was fortunate enough actually to have a different and better experience of gender opportunities. Uh, I was born into a family uh, with very typical gender roles. My father was the sole breadwinner and my mother was a stay at home mom. And, uh, even though my mom was very, was lowly educated, she only had three years of education, uh, but she was very actively involved in the Sarawak Daya Women's Association, which is an association uh, that strives to elevate the Daya woman status to participate fully in nation building uh, through education, uh, educational, social, and also economic strategies. So from very young, I was told by my mother, not, you know, she 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 will say this in Iban, of course, in my language. So she will say, "Anang nom kalah laki." So translated, it means never ever feel inferior to boys. And uh, education was very highly prioritized in my family, and my mother used to drum it, you know, into our heads that education was our ticket to economic independence. And I suppose her way of thinking was probably, you know, the biggest influence on how her four daughters. Uh, view opportunities in careers, and uh, all my four, all my three sisters actually uh, are heads of organization. Were heads of organization. Yeah, they are all retired now, and uh, two of them are actually in very traditionally male-dominated fields of accounting and uh, economics. So, you know, with that sort of upbringing, it was natural for me to accept that uh, I achieved my leadership because of what I can do and not despite being a woman. Now, Professor Gina, in your 2011 STEM study, you did a research to look into the parental influence of women in Malaysian engineering classes. So question one, what were your findings on parental influence on choice of careers? Uh, you also compared these findings with women in American engineering classes. So question two is, did you find any significant differences? And if there are, what are they? Oh, Puan Anis, thank you for that question. And thank you for sharing your own background, which is really fascinating. And actually, we, we just did a study in 2018 with the women, working women of Borneo. We, you know, my research has gone in a different direction. I'm really interested in modernity and how working women contribute. And, and we, we were struck by the indigenous uh, women of Borneo that they were, they were very empowered. They were really, um, they did not feel you know, oppressed, really. It didn't seem to be. They, they, they were very empowered, especially uh, spiritually. There was a spiritual leader of uh, every community who was a woman. So that's fascinating. That's really congruent with that. But let me go back to my first study in Malaysia, which was a replication of my colleague's study. My colleague, Dr. Beislein, did a study in America on women engineering because about 10 years ago, we were really starting to panic. Why aren't women studying engineering? You know, what, what's going on with STEM? And uh, we didn't have a lot of women enrolled in our classes at Wilkes University. And 
and she she didn't uh, she worked she was at a different university, but she did a study of women in engineering classes and about what was going on, what influenced them to select engineering as as a career, and what was the parental influence. So I replicated that study with my Malaysian colleagues in um, Malaysia, and we found some some commonalities. Uh, first of all, these both sides. Both countries, the women were the kind of people that were sort of, they really like to take things apart and put them back together again. Of course, they had that that aptitude, even though, uh, you know, Malaysians sort of didn't want to brag about their aptitude much. Americans are more direct, like, yeah, I was really good at that. But you would hear Malaysians say, well, I, I really wasn't good, but I did this. And, you know, uh, so that was a little difference in style. But we found that. But about parental influences... Um, we found both were closer to mom than dad, but they were all, they got a lot of support from both parents. And in fact, the, the Malaysians, uh, bo both considered their mothers as their role models. And, and the funny thing was the difference between them was the Malaysian women mothers were working full time, most of them. And the American women had left the workforce and were stay-at-home moms. So that was very interesting. So when we asked them the question, you know, what did you, uh, what did you do? Uh, like, why did you choose the profession? They said, they their answers expressed in both countries that it's a caring profession. It shows that you care about the world. That you, you want to create a better world. So that's why, you know, typically women, if they see engineering as a caring profession, then they will choose it. Well, the, the drastic difference that we saw right away was that there were a lot more engineering students in the Malaysian classrooms. We couldn't figure out what are you doing that we, you know, what can we learn from Malaysia? Because there was like 50 percent in some of the classes that we, we um, talked the the women that we talked to. So um, we uh, the Malaysian women, a couple of them told us that there had been some sort of media campaign put out by the the government that showed engineers, you know, women engineers, as they said, doing engineering, because maybe they didn't have exposure. To what does that look like in their own lives? But somehow they got the idea from a media blitz in Malaysia that they could do this. This is something they could do. And, you know, with the the hijab or the tudong and uh, all the different ethnicities showing that women should be doing this. So uh, maybe that's what contributed. Some of them said so. And we asked them, well, who had more influence on your choice, your mom or your dad? And the Americans said their, their mothers had more influence on their cho choice of uh, studying engineering and being an engineer. But the Malaysians said it was their father. And their father was highly involved and was very uh, empowering and uh, always encouraging you can do this, you know. So uh, that was that was kind of interesting, those differences. A lot of similarities, but that one big difference, yeah. All right. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Gina. Now, uh, the next question, yeah. Even though woman is generally still underrepresented across all sectors, there is a general shift in the global perspective of successful leadership. Uh, gone are the days when leadership was just about command and control and being authoritative. Uh, nowadays, there's a general shift to say that um, effective leadership incorporates collaborative and transformational style. And this would include, you know, build the, uh, empathy building, building relations, persuasion, and also team building. And these are normally, you know, traits that are generally associated with women. And uh, I, I was reading, you know, the comments from our participants, this one by Norshila Garcia, and she was making this observation that she says, you know, when a woman chairs a meeting, she tends to ask more questions than when uh, the, the male boss is, uh, is uh, chairing the meeting. So I suppose that will be rapport talk. I suppose that's developing intimacy. But anyway, Prof Gina, do you see this perspective of successful leaders, uh, this new, this global, this uh, new perspective of successful leaders as a way forward in dealing with gender inequality in educational uh, leadership? 
Oh, yes. Great question, Juananis. Yeah, I definitely see that there is more acceptance the, lately of different styles of leadership. And as, as you know, leadership theories are emerging all the time. But yes, there. Uh, in fact, I, I watched uh, Dr. Prima's session on emotional intelligence and how important that is to have, you know, to pay attention to the A, the affective, because emotional intelligence is, is, is the thing that sets good leaders apart, that they, that they are tending to those things. Absolutely. In fact, when I think about when I first got into uh, gender issues, it, it was a long time ago with Sandra Bem. Bem did research on um, g gender differences. And she, she devised the BEM sex inventory. And as you say, there are certain characteristics that are thought of as feminine, such as, you know, caring or uh, rapport, and then certain male characteristics. So what she did was she put them all on the scale. And then she, uh, she devised the, the, the inventory. And then she found uh, she uh, sides in order to parent and were the, the most effective and the, and the children were best adjusted. So she did a lot of things uh, looking at, she wrote the lens of gender and she talked about, you know, the Audubon Society used to have pictures of the birds and it would always be the male of every species. But sometimes the male isn't the one that you want to see. Sometimes you want to see the female. So it was, she brought awareness to us that the men the male was the default and yeah i think you're right i think there's a lot more acceptance i see us moving forward very nicely now and i think that same acceptance in differences in leadership style is going to that very thing will be it that promotes the, the leadership uh in, in women so good question right. thank you okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Gina, for a very interesting sharing. Uh, lots of uh, praises for your talk here when you read in the comments box and everybody is very happy with your sharing. Uh, I'm sorry that we will not be able to take uh, all the questions from the participants, but the committee will get back to you and do a follow up. And I'm sure all of us has gained uh, valuable insights on this issue and we'll go back with renewed vigor to do our part in promoting gender equality in education, particularly in leadership. Let's break the cycle of gender inequality. Big changes starts with small actions. And with that, I now hand the session over to Dr. Selva. Thank you very much. Thank you, Puan Anis and Prof. Gina for the valuable insights on gender equality in educational leadership. That was a very interesting talk and we have lots of uh, them out there who are appreciating what you discussed today. That brings us to wrap up the 18 series webinar, which started from September 1st and today is our last day. E-certificates will be sent to you. We will also share the colloquium proceedings via your email. Do get in touch with the speakers for further collaboration. As the closing, I would like you to meet the working committee of IPG KBA's virtual colloquium. Let's welcome the team. Hi, a very good afternoon to all of you from Malaysia. We have come to the end of our 18th series uh, colloquium session. I'm uh, truly privileged to introduce uh, to you, all of you present here uh, four other members who have contributed immensely towards this colloquium, and they would say a few words. First of all, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Ghazali, who is the head of the unit. Dr. Ghazali. Hi, salam and greetings from Kuala Lumpur. A very good afternoon. My name is Ghazali. In this current situation of COVID pandemic, I essentially hope everyone is safe and remember to adhere to the respective SOPs. And uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate all COMAD participants for successfully participating in this online course organized by IPG KBA Kuala Lumpur. COMAD is specially designed to meet the participants' needs, especially in the area of educational leadership and management. 
and uh, this online colloquium was planned to accommodate to the new norm in view of the current global COVID pandemic. And as, a, as an educator, these challenges should not deter us from continuing to seek knowledge. This I certainly hope that all of you have benefited from this program and will apply the knowledge in your daily duties and activities. Lastly, please stay safe and I'm sure that we will have the opportunity to meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ghazali. The second person I would like uh, you to uh, like to introduce is Dr. Selva. Hi, I'm, I'm Selva. Uh, thank you for joining the colloquium and we are privileged to have the whole world in Malaysia at one point of the time and we enjoyed having all of you. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the other department members, even though we are a very small group or committee who conducted this uh, colloquium, but I'm privileged to have all the other department members contributing towards this uh, program. So thank you very much and stay safe. I would like to call upon Dr. Prema Nair. Hello everyone, it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this family. Thank you for all of you who have been watching the webinar series from day one till the last. And I wish you all the best and hopefully we'll meet again next year. And finally, I would like to call upon Mr. Varugis. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is uh, Varugis, people call me VC. Uh, thank you very much for attending our COMAT colloquium. Uh, it's, it's truly an amazing program, huh? something that started as an idea and then flourished, and today we have come to the end. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there are many people who have contributed a lot to this particular colloquium. They are all from the International Languages Teacher Training Institute. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Matno, who has been uh, uh, instrumental in getting all the posters ready. I would like to thank Ms. Siti Maslin, who was instrumental in ensuring that all the messages that you have received thus far is actually from her through Facebook. And there are many others who have contributed a lot. What we will be doing right now will be, we will be planning for next year. So hope you will uh, tune in and uh, wait for our, uh, what do you call email, which we'll be sending uh, to you most probably next year by August or June, July or August. And we will inform you what we have planned for you for the future. So thank you for all the participation for the, Participants from the 58 countries, we have more than 2,500 participants. Thank you so much, those who have uh, uh, been attending all the sessions and you have viewed all the recordings. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, I would like to invite the director of IPG KBA, Inche Alias Bain Said to say a few words in his recorded session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now that we have reached the end of uh, Institute Pendidikan Guru Bahasa Antarabangsa Virtual Colloquium 2020, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to make a few closing remarks at the end of 18 sessions of productive and fruitful days of the event. This virtual colloquium is set out to be a platform for sharing information, ideas and visions, and that we have achieved given the range of inputs and perspectives from panels, from panel members and participants involved. We shall reflect upon what was shared and consolidate our own personal perspective on leadership. Indeed, there is plenty to reflect upon and if this colloquium in any way enhances our individual and collective contribution to deal with the global education challenges, then this colloquium can truly be considered a great success. To put it in context, let me start with the colloquium's theme, Capacity Building, Educational Leadership and Management. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders have a deeper and more lasting influence on organization and provide more comprehensive leadership if their focus extends beyond maintaining high standards. 
Therefore, creating and sharing knowledge is central to effective leadership. Information of which we have a glut only becomes knowledge through a social process. For this reason, relationships and professional learning communities are essential. Organization must foster knowledge giving as well as knowledge seeking. We endorse continual, le continual learning when we say that individuals should constantly add to their knowledge base. But there will be little to add if people are not sharing. A norm of sharing one's knowledge with other is the key to continual growth for all. We are truly gratified that presenters and the 2,500 participants from 58 countries have made a special effort in participating in this conference. This undertaking, hopefully, will greatly encourage us to organize more of such event as a continuation of our effort and to provide a platform for knowledge sharing and exchange. We also hope to further contribute by providing space and time for the ongoing professional development, a chance to upgrade knowledge, a venue to meet fellow educators from different backgrounds, time to forge professional relationships, and potential outlook for future collaborations. The proceeding of this colloquium will be made into a compodium and will be sent to all the participants, to those who would like to attain more information pertaining to conducting a similar colloquium, will be able to do so as the organizing committee will prepare a handbook. To end my closing remark, allow me to congratulate the colloquium organizer and the committee for successful colloquium, including the quality of the sessions. I would like to express my gratitude to the rector of the Teacher Training Institute, the 19 presenter and the staff from the Education Resources and Technology Division. I would, like, I would also like to express my gratitude to everyone who made this colloquium a reality. Lastly, we will listen to the Rector of Institute of Teacher Education Malaysia, to you, the Rector. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Hi, everybody. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the International Languages Teacher Training Institute for providing this platform to bring together a host of educators from various countries to share their knowledge and expertise in relation to the theme on leadership. The theme Capacity Building, Educational Leadership and Management is indeed apt and crucial to realize the vision and mission of the Institute's Strategic Development Plan. This webinar series has reached more than 2,500 participants covering 58 countries worldwide. I believe the director of IBG Campus Bahasa Antarabangsa has a strong vision and aims when deciding on this webinar series, which has brought about positive and impactful sessions throughout the two-month period. Together with a dynamic and committed workforce team from the Planning, Innovation and Research Department, IPG Campus Bahasa Antarabangsa has reflected one common trait, which is the quality to lead. This is clearly evidenced from the commitment determination and teamwork of the committee members. Once again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the International Languages Teacher Training Institute, or IBA, the Education Resources and Technology Division, BSTP, or the 19 presenters, moderators, chairpersons, and organizing committee who have made this colloquium a reality. It is my hope that there is a continuation of such webinar series in the years to come. Such and diverse would definitely bring sharing of knowledge and ideas which we could take with us in improving. Hi, 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Mohammad Noor for the posters you received all the while. Miss Maslin for the advertisements on the Facebook. She was such a darling to update you on the Facebook every day. The students of IPK, IPG KBA for the videos and the repertory. Miss Noor Isha for the registration, evaluation forms and the certificates which you will be receiving soon. All the wonderful moderators we had. Dr. Ghazali and Mr. Vargas for ensuring the running of the program and dear Dr. Prema for her contributions towards the program. My head of department, Dr. Chandran, the drive behind this virtual colloquium, the director and deputy director of IPG KBA, the rector of Institute of Teacher Education Malaysia, all the pre presenters who shared their knowledge with us. And most importantly, the Education Technology Division for 18 series live broadcast to all of you. Special thanks to Mr. Sharul, Mr. Izwan, and Dr. Suras. With that, do look out for email on our next web webinar sessions in September 2021. Take care and stay safe. Signing off from Malaysia. Dr. Selva. Bye.